Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Dorothy here from the CCMA. You're very welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Uh, delighted that we are being hosted by Log Me In, uh, and you'll see there Joseph Wodge and Luis. Sorry, I, I my screen, I can't see the surname Martins on the call on the, on the webinar. Um, and I think if there's one company that has uh, seen a surge in activity uh, during this uh, challenging period for the last few months, it's certainly been Log Me In. Uh, and we've obviously been delighted to be working with them on our webinars. Um, and they have supported us on all of the webinars and we're very appreciative of that. So thanks to Joe and Sean and the team that hopefully are, are on the call as well. Uh, and obviously we just announced in the last week or so that uh, Log Me In are going to be our overall sponsors for this year's awards, which is fantastic to be getting that support. So again, uh, thanks to all of the team, we really appreciate it. Um, so as normal, we're going to give it one more minute for everybody to log on. I can see people logging in there uh, as I speak. Uh, very much, we want this to be an interactive session. Uh, and we want you to put forward any questions that you have. And I think for those of you who've been on the webinar before, you'll know the little panel there to the right is where you can put your questions on. Uh, we'll be recording this webinar, so it'll be available afterwards as well for you to share it with colleagues and friends. Um, but I know we're going to follow a sort of a question and answer format with Joe and Louise, so uh, we, we, we'll go through that. Uh, so just to give the formal introduction in terms of title, Joe is the International Product Marketing Manager and Louise is the Customer Care Manager. Um, and as you'll have seen from the promotion material for this uh, event, they have experienced a huge increase in the volumes of uh, contacts into their contact centre. So I think we're going to get first-hand uh, knowledge uh, from Louise as to how they've coped with this and hopefully some hints and tips for all of us in terms of how they've been able to support their customers. Um, so, Joe, OK, with you, I'm going to hand over uh, and I'll let you do the introductions. And thank you so much. Uh, no problem. Thanks for having us. And yeah, uh, really happy to be sponsoring the CCMA Awards um, this year. So we hope everybody will hear uh, a lot more from us over the coming months as we build up to the, the big event in November. And fingers crossed we do get to sit down in the Clayton and uh, share a drink and enjoy that night um, because those awards are always a great night and uh, some hard earned awards as well uh, distributed on the evening to all the, all the, um, the nominees. Um, just a, guys, a quick bit of background on Log Me and Dorothy kind of set the scene uh, a little bit. Um, we are one of the biggest um, software as a service companies in the world. Okay, We employ over 4,000 people, normally in 25 different offices around the world, but currently working from 4,000 different locations as we find ourselves working from home. And we will all be at home until uh, 2021 at the earliest. Okay, So um, we've very much uh, found ourselves working remotely. Um, we, It's something that we live and breathe every day. Okay, We sell uh, thankfully tools that help people work from anywhere. Um, we are the work from anywhere company, and it means that we've had a huge surge in uh, people contacting our business, uh, like Dorothy alluded to earlier on. In fact, if I give some figures, I think in February, we were running about 80,000 contacts into the into the, the contact centers, Luis, and that went past 200,000 plus in March and continued at those levels uh, through, through the COVID period. So we've seen like an absolute explosion in, um, in, in, in traffic coming into our contact centers. And that's what we, we wanted to bring Louise here today because that's caused huge challenges for us as a business to, to manage that, that surge, um, both from a, an operational standpoint and also from a, a customer supporting standpoint. And Louise is going to give us some insights because I think that's really relevant to the, the CCMA and its audience because obviously contact center and dealing with customers is the lifeblood of what you do. And hopefully we can uh, share some lessons and some learnings uh, trade the course of the next 20, 30 minutes or so. But before we do that, just um, log me in has really kind of found ourselves at the uh, center of the COVID crisis, right? Uh, our products um, are what many organizations are using now and have been using prior to COVID to work remotely, to keep employees and colleagues in touch regardless of, of where they are. Um, our products are always built with three very simple uh, pillars in terms of uh, making sure they're really super simple to use from an employee experience perspective because they demand that real simplicity in, in the platforms they use because of the consumerization of IT, they're used to the latest and greatest technology free and apps that they get that can download from Play Stores. They expect that from a business perspective as well. So user experience is always at the fore of everything that we do. We want these tools to be as easy to deploy as they are to use. Not only do we have end users that we need to keep in mind, we have all the managers and the supervisors and the IT teams that deploy these and make sure that for them it's a simple enough process as well. And as always, control, security, and privacy is really paramount when it comes to using our tools, particularly when we work remotely. Um, and that's something that we put great pride in when we build our products and build our architecture. 
Just to give you kind of a reason why the CCMA is a really good fit for us today, okay? Um, first of all, we're a 4,000 strong organization and we have uh, millions of customers, okay? And we need to deal with these end users and customers on a day-to-day -day basis. So from a contact center perspective and learning how to engage and, and treat customers and deal with customers, we think the CCMA is a fantastic membership base. Uh, they do some great events and there's a huge amount for us to learn by being part of the CCMA. Also, you guys as an audience are, are a really good fit for our products, okay? And just to bring you through, you know, some of them and show how we've been helping during the COVID period is, you know, with Log Me In, we have our Bold 360 product, which is our artificial intelligence powered chatbot um, that we have a number of different organizations using to automate a lot of customer queries and help initial triage and really kind of improve the speed of response that customers are getting and to reduce the burden on the, on the people in those contact centers as well to automate as much as we can and give people a seamless, a seamless simple, fast experience when, when looking to answer queries. Uh, Rescue, believe it or not, is a tool for logging onto laptops and uh, services remotely. Okay, so a lot of a lot of we use it internally to help troubleshoot a lot of our own employees. I said we're working from four thousand different locations. You know, should something go wrong with applications or, or platforms that we use, our IT team need to be able to access everybody, and they use tools like Rescue to do that. So regardless of where they are and where the end users are, we can get in touch with their with their platforms or software and their laptops and troubleshoot them. Go to you know, includes tools like today, GoToWebinar, which you know has been used by many organizations to stay in touch with their customers, to keep telling their story. You know, in the absence of any physical events, we need to find many ways as possible to take those conversations virtually. And GoToWebinar, the tool we're using today, uh, has been a fantastic tool and many, many companies are relying on that over the last six months. And prior to that, as, as virtual events always kind of grew in, in popularity over the last couple of years. Our video conferencing tool, GoToMeeting, I'm sure you're all using video conferencing in some form uh, over the last couple of months. I got a meeting as market leading video conferencing tool. And again, something that's been used uh, in all four corners of the globe to keep employees and everybody else together. We've got a connect, which is our cloud-based telephony system and support center. So a contact center for small organizations to really help them learn a bit more about their business and help them grow by giving them the key insights and data that they, that they can get from their telephony platform. And they, the basic supervised skills and monitoring skills and call queue management skills for, for contact centers to get them started and getting them you know, a real kind of rich uh, contact center experience um, for the lower end of the market, people that maybe feel that the existing platforms are, are out of their reach. LastPass is all about your security, your passwords, making sure everybody who's logging in remotely now can do so safely. And then Central as well is also about remote login, getting to IT, IT systems, IT stacks, and making sure regardless of where they are, and what premises they're in, that the IT team can get access to them as well. That's why we've been at the corner of kind of the, the corner of everything COVID over the last six months. We've been a huge support to our customers, uh, a huge support to, to new organizations that have started using your products that took advantage of our emergency response kits that we put out for frontline teams but also the reason why we saw a massive surge in our contact center over the last couple of months. And that's what brings me to Luis and what we wanted to talk about. Luis is our customer care manager. He's had to deal with a lot of these challenges firsthand. Um, and I'd like to bring Luis in to tell us a bit of that story and, and what they've learned over the last couple of months and hopefully part some knowledge on the audience today. And you guys might take something away that will help you and your contact centers uh, as you plan for returning to the office uh, or you, if you're back at the office and you, you manage what you can to the best of your ability over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. So Luis, welcome today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joe and Shen. Thank you for everyone for joining this webinar. Uh, and oh. yes, it has been quite quite challenging to adapt to this to this new, new normal. Uh, there's a lot of topics that we can discuss. I'm not sure if Joe, if you wanna start, uh, if yeah. there's anything that you wanna start with. Yeah, well, I think if we go right back to the beginning, Luis, like I think it was late December, you know, we started hearing about COVID-19 on the news channels and it was pretty much a, mm -hmm. you know, a Chinese um, problem then, yeah. obviously concerns from the who, there was a lot of uh, alerts put out. Um, when did we realize as a business that oh, we're, we're seeing a, you know, a pretty big influx of calls into our contact center here, we're seeing, you know, a greater appetite for products. I think we always knew we would get the appetite, but in terms of the size of the demand when it came. When did you first start seeing that in our in our front lines? We, if my memory serves me right, I think it was the first week of March when we started seeing things kind of explode, right? It, we had seen a slight uptick, but then first week of March, specifically in EMEA with Italy, that got more severely affected first. That's, that's when it kind of blew up. Okay, uh, so predominant increase from Italian um, uh, businesses coming in initially, and obviously 
people will be aware of the news reports at the time. I think a few of the first cases in Europe identified in, in ski resorts in Italy. So we saw a surge in, in, uh, in traffic coming in from Italy. We, we also announced as a business then our emergency response work kits as well to, to help people through it. Um, did that play a part in driving traffic as well? And, and then how quickly after Italy uh, started kind of ramping up did you see it coming from other countries as well? It, the, the emergency remote work, it's definitely played a big part because people, a, a lot of business people that never needed or used regularly remote tools suddenly need those to continue working. Uh, and they looked for options and, and, and they saw and locked me in uh, a very reliable, a very reliable option. So they started reaching out to our structure through sales, to, through support. And, and we saw that being the first wave of questions, which is kind of a save me, you know, what do I do? How do I get this? How do I get this to, to continue working? And we saw that, like I mentioned, primarily from Italy uh, at the start, but then about two, three weeks in, I think two weeks in, France started as well. And then shortly after Germany, and, and okay. for us, that's when the big biggest increase happened in Europe was when, when Germany got more seriously affected. Yeah, and just, just for the, the people in the audience today, to put a bit of context on that, Luis, we have a business in Italy, we have a business in France, but Germany is a, a really big, important market for us. We have two offices in Germany, go to meetings, actually German built. Um, there's a lot of history there in Germany. And, and that's why when Germany started entering lockdown, we really saw that, that increase in surge in traffic to our calls. So... Obviously, we, we talked about the figure. I think we went from 80,000 inbound contacts in February to you know, north of 200,000 in March. What kind of plans do you need to put in place to react to that you know, in terms of resources? Because obviously, we don't have you know, uh, 50% of our contact center teams sitting around waiting for a surge. This is something that would have <laughs> we needed would have to ramp up pretty fast. How did you guys manage that? Yes, that was, that was probably the most difficult part at the start. And the the problem that we faced is that it was the uncertainty because we no one knew is this going to last one month one year you know how how long are the markets going to be behaving like this so because the first thing that you think as a manager when there's when the workload doubles or triples is let's get more people right but if you don't know how long that workload is going to be there for it becomes difficult to to reason hiring more people so what we decided to do was to kind of weather the storm with the available resources that we had by by plugging into all the corners of the organization. So at that point, we needed people that knew the products and or had the language skills that we needed to support European markets. And we did just that. We, we started recruiting people from customer success, from you know uh, office management, receptionists, to finance, to whatever, uh, talent acquisition as well. So whoever had those language skills or, or product skills, we uh, delivered some express training so then they could handle uh, at a very basic level customers and started bringing people onto the phones so we could weather that, that peak of volume and then have a clear idea of how is this all going to turn out to be like. Yeah, and I think, Louise, if I recall correctly, it was really a case of all hands on deck and I've heard stories of, I think with some of our American offices, where we took people from the, the coffee shops in our offices and actually trained them up because they had knowledge of, yep. of LogMe and they had knowledge of GoTo. They, they knew and understood a bit about our products because they worked in our business every day. And I will get to it in a minute because the offices were shutting. They were actually looking like they were going to be going out of work and we redeployed them into our, our, our contact center teams to help you know, feel that surge. So we've got that surge coming in. You're, you're, you're drastically trying to pull resources from every choir to to, to manage this this uh, influx of calls, right? And I think it was March 12th, uh, along the same lines as the, I think the Irish government made the decision to close the schools, we closed our offices, we closed our buildings, mm -hmm. okay? Um, talk to me about the extra level of complexity that added, not only having to deal with the surge in traffic, but having to send every agent home to work from home as well. Uh, logistically, we were kind of prepared, we were mostly prepared for it because our, our internal IT was, was very much so on top of it. We we had in the past, specifically in Dublin, a few storm alerts that we had to work from home for a day or two. It was more a question of having all the, you know, chargers, headsets, that that more basic stuff ready to, to go. And we had that. The more complicated part was assisting agents in that change, right? Because 
some go home and they have proper work environment and they have an office or room and they have a quiet environment. Others have three kids, you know, running around and asking for food and throwing toys around. And, it, you know, it becomes difficult not only to focus on your work, but even to talk with customers. So adjusting every agent to working from home was, I think, the most difficult challenge that we had at that point. The okay. first, I'd say. Okay. And, and did obviously because it's interesting i hadn't thought about that louise i'm, I'm also only with log me in since uh last summer um but you've taken learnings from storm Ophelia, you've taken learnings from beast of the east where in the past we had to send people home so did that give you was there anything then that you encountered or, or the challenges that you encountered that you expected to encounter because of, of past experience and then was there anything unexpected that you that you encountered that you needed to deal with um definitely a couple of them expected because we had storms before and whatnot so that they're sometimes somewhat similar um so around resources and logistics we were kind of prepared it was more the human factor of this more prolonged change that we weren't ready for so we had before you know people working from home for a week it's different when your entire household is at home for a month two and three so we started to be a a lot more concerned about mental health of all of our employees not that we weren't before but we adjusted to this new normal as well and i had employees that all of a sudden they're working at home with their with their son and with their wife and their stress on both of their jobs and you know people lash out and it, it's hard to manage that new normal when, we, when you don't have any personal space and that's what happened to a lot of our employees so Talk us through, Luis, a few of the initiatives that you, you implemented to help with that side of things. We, and we, yes, there were quite a few, and we did focus a lot of effort and time on the mental health part of things while we were adjusting to this new normal. So we started setting up, on top of the usual one-on-ones, uh, we delegated this task to one of our leaders in, in EMEA for her to reach out and have uh, a catch up to see how they're doing from a personal perspective once or once a week or once every two weeks with everyone in our structure so she was doing that with everyone then reporting back to to line managers uh, we decided to put in place this was more when the summer uh, was starting we decided to put in place uh, what we call summer hours so every week usually every year an employee can leave early on Friday for two hours and they work those two hours in the week. This year, what we decided is that no one had to work those two hours. Everyone could just once once a week leave two hours early to have a little bit of a breather. And that I think helped a lot. On top of that, as you know, Joe, we, we had a company-wide decision of implementing self-care days, which is one day a month that we can have off that can, doesn't come out of their balance. Uh, or anything like that, that they're just, they're incentivized to have off as a day for themselves, you know, to regain that personal space that they lost going home. Uh, and at the very start, and I think that played a part as well in connecting everyone, because one of the things that we did while leveraging resources, we pull, we had specialist teams, right? This team would support these products, that team would support those, and, and, and so on. So we ended up delivering express training and cross-skilling everyone all of a sudden all everyone that could provide support was providing support for all the products so we wanted to connect to everyone teams that were in the past working parallelly working together so we we uh changed the way that we uh, went on about our communication we we organized everyone in in one particular channel so that everyone started communicating with each other you're you're talking uh, about slack there louise that you use slack channels to to correct. bring everybody together okay so we organized everyone in the same Slack channel, and then we started organizing, um, you know, off work online activities. And, and one of them was that we had online tournaments, online gaming tournaments, uh, very quick, very, you know, basic games that we had so that people uh, in between calls, whenever they wanted to have a break, that they could play with another colleague that they haven't met before. And people actually engaged in that and people started to be, you know, quite competitive. Uh, which which also helped to take the mind off of the I'm in lockdown I can't leave you know I'm handling three times more work than what I was before 
uh, and I think that also played a big part. Yeah, I, th I think I can I can really relate to that. Um, one thing I've noticed from not being around the office is there's plenty of people I used to meet and speak with every day, uh, and you build up relationships and a network with them. But actually, I don't encounter them too much in my day to day job because maybe they're in finance or they're in HR and they're in a different kind of part of the business. You don't mm -hmm. have that many interactions. And I think I suppose from our contact center perspective, everybody's so focused on the customer and dealing with the customer that you know any engagements they're going to have is lighthearted, water cooler uh, moments, maybe some team meetings. Know, chatting to people on the floor, chatting to the people sitting beside them, and you take that away, it becomes a very kind of lonely position to be in. That 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 is true. That the human interaction, uh, the majority of our employees miss that, and and we have surveyed all of our uh, organization in terms of engagement and also in terms of how you're doing from a work from home perspective. Uh, and and there's a substantial part of people that although they're okay working from home, they miss that human interaction. They, they, it's not as good to work from home. They can do it, but they would prefer to have some office interactions. Yeah, I, I think I think it'd be interesting to hear from other contact centers out there if that's a similar position they find themselves in. Because I've always found I've worked in and around contact centers for you know, the last fifteen years, working in in marketing upon a large consumer organizations and stuff like that. And there's always a great energy uh, that comes out of the contact center. There's a great kind of vibrance. You don't have to the noise on the floor. It's the hustle and bustle. It's people talking. It that creates a nice level that can you can feed off that. It can really motivate you. And even I've noticed since I've come back from a couple of weeks break that you come back from a couple of weeks off and you're you're ready to go again, but you're sitting in the sitting room by yourself. Uh, and you're looking for that motivation and that energy. And if you don't have that spark from other people, it becomes a bit of a challenge. So We've, we've looked at that, that we, we had a number of initiatives to make sure that our employees were feeling more included, that they uh, had a number of kind of uh, times to take time out. Um, in terms of the customers, have you noticed a difference in the requirements of the customers in terms of, is it just more of the same because we've always been selling the same tools that we've been selling or is there a change in their needs and their requirements? There was most definitely a change. And, and that's something that we also focused on at the very start that I think played a big part in how we adjusted to this to this new normal because when we saw the the you know contacts from Italy blow up we realized that this is serious right this is not going to just going to be Italy and what we immediately started was taking note of the reasons customers were getting to us uh, from Italy and we understood that the first couple of weeks first two three weeks they were reaching out with a help me kind of request, you know, I, I need something to, to keep working. And once they were supplied with the products, then it shifted aggressively after three or four weeks of that market having, you know, started blowing up, it changed to, okay, how I have it, how do I use it? I have it, I'm trying to do this and I can't. So more basic troubleshooting and basic usage, usage questions. So what we did at that point, uh, was we provided to the agents the articles, templates, for them to more rapidly provide the necessary information to customers. And we made sure that they were on top of everything, right? The, the more basic, how does the customer get the product? How does he make it work? Uh, and, and that played a big part. We tailored our support pages to have those inf that type of information in front of your face. So as soon as you That's went on support side, you would have that in your face, you know, more basic usage and more basic troubleshooting, how to assign profiles, that sort of thing, so that pe so, people can self-serve. Yeah, so th that's important, Luis, because you, you talk about, um, we're learning about the customers, we're learning about their new challenges, we're, we're updating our um, information booklets for our agents so they can reduce the, 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 the handling time with the customers, they can get to the, uh, answer the queries faster because they're more familiar. And then you're trying to go, well, how can we actually move this to more self-serve automated? And you're talking like support pages that we updated. What else did we kind of use to, to automate our processes to give a better, more efficient um, service to the customer? One, another thing that we did uh, that fell on our customer success uh, department was the, we increased greatly the, the offering of product trainings that we had. So we doubled and tripled depending on the market, the offerings that we had. And we saw the registrations for those webinars uh, increase tenfold easily. So there were a lot more people that needed to know how to use the product. And we decided to start reaching out to them proactively. You know, here's sessions, they're available. Join in, learn how to use the product instead of having to call 
the, the support center. Those two measures, you know, focusing on, on improving our help pages and proactively reaching out to customers, opening training sessions, that definitely helped uh, flatten yeah. the curve. Yeah, because I think we, we saw a huge surge in registrations for webinars. I think we were getting 3,000, 4,000 registrations at a time in the different markets to, to come and learn about, you know, what products to use when and, yeah. you know, things even things around video conferencing etiquette and, you know, learning the top five tips for working remotely. We saw a huge amount of, of interest in that at the time. Um, Luis, that, that's really great. We're just coming towards the, the end of the time now and we can bring um, Dorothy back in for some Q&A. She might have some questions there from the audience. But while we're getting Dorothy back in, do you have any last bit of advice or recommendations for the audience in terms of how they might take some of our learnings and, and implement them into, the, into their contact centers? I'll say that the, the key points that I took away from all of this was that you can prepare up to you can prepare up to a certain level, right? You you can prepare from a logistical perspective, you can prepare processes, but then it's a matter of how quickly you adjust to what has just been thrown your way. And and while doing that, making sure that you're communicating effectively with everyone in your structure so that you can receive feedback mm -hmm. and act on that feedback is critical. The part that I miss the most as an individual was the all of a sudden I can read the room because there was no room. So I couldn't I couldn't understand if the teams under me were close to the burnout phase or not. Using and thankfully we have those tools go to meeting to connect individually with everyone on a recurrent basis definitely played a big part in in allowing me to adjust to this new moment. So I would say communication, you can prepare up to a certain level, but then you're gonna need active communication to be able to adjust to the new normal. Cool, so preparation and communication. I would say so, Good. and, Good. and Good. having tools for both. Cool, perfect. Thanks, Luis. Dorothy, thanks very much for your time. Uh, that was great, really interesting. I think one question that I'd have that has come through is, and it's come through in a lot of our webinars is obviously the peaks and troughs of this. I mean, we're going through a bit of a trough here at the moment with sort of new restrictions coming in and I'm in lockdown Kildare, so I definitely know what that feels like. Um, have you any advice on that, Lewis, as, as to how you, how you, and different people are at different stages, so everybody and different people have different approaches to the challenges that we're all living in. So have you any advice on how you've managed that to, to, to deal with those peaks and troughs? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's it's about recalibrating expectations, I think, and 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 to a certain extent, even lowering your standards, because all all of a sudden you brought work home, and and at home again you might have a proper work environment, and that's fine, and you can kind of keep the same standards, the same work rate. You know, uh, other people may not. Uh, me, for example, I have a two-year-old son uh, with me, so sometimes meetings are challenging, and focusing on on you know, strategic work is challenging when someone you know, is throwing toys around the, the living room. So <laughs> recalibrating and, and deciding what you're not going to do is is important, right? Deciding what you're not going to do, I think is as important as deciding what you are going to do and with pri with which priority, you need to let something go. When, when your workload increases, and for some markets in our case, it increased sevenfold, something has to drop. So it's it's about recalibrating, otherwise you go crazy. Yeah. I think as yeah. well, Dorothy, what I would add to that is that I wouldn't I wouldn't think too far ahead for now, you know, deal 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 with the now. I think it's new territory for everybody. And even like we live and breed remote working. You know, we, we have a real flexible mm. setup. I said we're we're at this for until at least January twenty twenty one and, and probably a little bit longer. Um and even now, six months in, we're beginning to experience new emotions and new feelings around remote working, right? So it's not like we're got to the stage now where you go through like the initial novelty at the start. Well, we're, we're all at home. You know, remote work is possible to, you know, the summertime and people enjoying it. And now people are maybe coming back from some staycations and they're going, oh, Jesus, it's kind of the same again. And this is going to be with us for a long time and maybe a bit of fatigue around remote working and a bit more longing for the office. So, um, I wouldn't think too far ahead. I think what Louis said in terms of communication, I think our organization has been really good at communication. Um, they've been really crystal clear on, on all the instructions. I think that's important because it allows you to get into a mental state. Like we know now 2020 is going to be at home um, uh, and we've got that clear date and it won't, ha it won't happen any sooner. 
uh, allows us to manage and work for that, and provide dedicated workspaces and stuff at home. Um, but also, you know, we do communicate daily. We had a, a call there earlier on where we had a bunch of people from to the Dublin office about 2030, just going through their feelings, going through how they're adapting, um, what are the highs, what are the lows, and the HR team are taking all that feedback and then they're adapting our our HR policies and you know the the programs we have for you know families or people looking after you know caring for people in their own home and stuff like that and making different allowances for all those different personas that we find. Yeah, no, and I must say I think your idea of the the wellness day every month is a lovely idea, and I've heard companies doing something similar, but even things like no meetings Mondays that there are no mm. you can put your head, you know clear your head, do whatever work you need to do without feeling that you have to be involved in a meeting because I think. The initial stages when companies were trying to build up the team moment, momentum, some of the novelty of that has worn off. So you need to, I suppose, read the room as well in terms of the audience and, and where people are at. That was brilliant. I think thank you so much. I know, Joe, anybody who has any further information they they, they want, they can just drop me an email or, or link in with LinkedIn um, and you'll be happy to provide any expertise or advice. And um, just with yet again, a plug to our awards. I mean, certainly the feedback I'm getting for people and we've got two weeks to the deadline today is that it is actually a really great way of pulling people together as a project to be putting submissions together. And we really are encouraging as many people as possible to enter this year. It will be slightly different, we know for sure, in terms of the ceremony, but again, we're working with the go-to on that and they're gonna help us with all their expertise in that area. Um, but absolutely encourage companies that are on the call, if you haven't thought about it already, uh, to think about entering the awards, even just to give a bit of recognition and to have something for people to look forward to and to build up a little bit of a buzz amongst team and individuals and, and the contact centre itself. So anybody with any questions on that, needless to say, just drop me a, an email or give me a call, happy to do that. So thank you so much. Thanks to Neve from WSI as always for being there in the background and, and helping out. And we have a, and, and a copy of the presentation up on the website, uh, by, certainly by this time tomorrow. But uh, thanks again, Joel, thanks Louise, and thanks to Neve. And we thanks for having us. Take care, bye-bye. Cheers guys, bye-bye.